A branching Deepanak has quickly come on the scene amongst Turtle Island as one of our leaders, and he comes from our generation, our generation that came up through the 1970s and witnessed our aunties and uncles and our mothers and our fathers and our grandparents who fought deeply for spaces like this, people who uh, encountered an incredible amount of obstacles but yet overcame them, and we witnessed that, and he witnessed that of his own grandparents at Pine Creek First Nation growing up. And living on the land and experiencing all of that beauty within that land, but also the struggles that we all had to overcome. And he brings that within his own work. He was very active in the past recent months, but has never really ever been idle. He's always been um, doing work. Uh, he's worked in Alberta. He was telling me a little bit about Northwest Territories, a little bit about his work uh, with the Métis, and with land claims, with political work throughout the country. Uh, he was previously the chief of Pine Creek First Nations and took that community from not only um, a very desperate financial situation to an, a an absolute economic recovery. So not only does he get able to inspire and empower, but also can turn a community from uh, a, dis a difficult situation to an empowered one as well. So we're very honored to have him. I have some, uh, he was voted in as Grand Chief of Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs in 2000 and 2011 and uh, has quickly inspired all of us and we invite him to share some of those words with us. I have some to say on. We'd like to invite you to share some, some words with us. So we ask you, sorry, we ask you to, uh, when, you, uh, when you speak, that you speak in this way of this, this series, the way we are, which speaks about truth, but only, not only truth, but truth that comes from your heart. And so we invite you to come and spend that time with our students and say miigwech for coming. I want to thank my staff, Tim Catchaway, who's going to be working the uh, technology volume of K, my senior political liaison sitting there, and Sheila North Wilson, who's going to be handling the communications technology in the presentation. It's a great honor for me to be here today to share a few ideas, <clears throat> celebrating who we were, who we are, and who we will be. I take the business of speaking to students, especially post secondary level students, very seriously because I know that it's our young people who have the passion and the energy to carry the agenda into the future for us. When I look at you as today's warriors, preparing yourselves for the work that you have ahead. And uh, I've always looked at education very seriously myself. I have a you know, first class honors BA from the University of Alberta. I have a law degree from Saskatchewan and Oxford Hall. And I was in partial completion of my master's degree at the University of Winnipeg when I was elected to be chief back home after receiving instructions from the women in my family that it's now time to take up leadership. People often wonder what my motivations are in taking on a leadership role. <clears throat> and I always you know, consider where my beginnings were. Being the Pine Creek First Nation, I am a Minnebozebe Anishinaabe. I come from the Nipanak family, <clears throat> the bear clan, that's me in the little white sweater there on the right side, and that's me in the blue sweater on the left side in the, the other picture. So. I come from a very close-knit family. You know, we didn't have running water. We didn't have uh, a lot of the luxuries that a lot of people took for granted in the, in the, in the 1970s. But we had each other, and we had my great-grandparents. They were the uh, cornerstone of our family. And some of you may come from very similar surroundings. We've got the fresh drinking water barrel there. That's where we got our drinking water from, you know, from the water truck. And that's how we lived. We lived in a very humble way, and I never forgot that, uh, that very humble beginning. You know, from there, I observed my grandma you know, fleshing moose hides, and I watched my grandpa bring in the, the fish from the nets on the lake, and that's how that's how we lived. You know, I, I carry that today as I move forward in, in time. I uh, have my own kids to worry about now. People often wonder, like I said, what are the motivations for me to be in politics and to change the way things are? Well, I've got you know two young girls. I've got my baby Meadow and 
Rebecca and I have my son to wait, and uh, you know, everything I do is to make sure that I leave a legacy for them. I leave a, a better tomorrow for them than the, than the situation that I've had to grow up in as a truly sovereign person. That's what my motivation really is. Some people might say that I'm after media attention or I'm after you know personal political agendas and so forth, but I've never really considered that anyone should pursue a personal political agenda. It's a very, very difficult lifestyle. It's a very difficult thing to, to do. This is a, a constant, uh, constant turmoil in the type of work we do, but we do it because we believe in, in what we can accomplish and what we can do for our families. So that's really what, uh, what this is all about for me. I'm trying to balance you know, the work that I do with uh, other elements and other aspects of, of, of my life. You know, I, uh, I like to get out to hunt. I'm missing hunting season right now as we speak. My family's been contacting me, wondering when I'm coming out so we can go get our moose. You know, and I'm here today, and I'll be here all week, and I'll be working again next week. So I might miss this year's hunting, which is really difficult for me because I have a responsibility to fill a freezer up the moose meat, just like other other people do in our roles within our communities. So. <clears throat> when I think about the type of work that we're doing, I think about you know the treaties and the spirit and intent of the of the work that we're supposed to do in leadership. You know, I've always thought that you know how how can I move through life, move through this special experience, and create the greatest value. You know, and going home and being chief. You know, it, it tied me back to the, the spiritual connections that need to be made. My connections within the community brought me the pilot, and that is my foundation. As a foundation that I work from when I do the work that I do, whether it be here in Winnipeg or whether in the city of Ottawa, the pipe always finds its way in, in guiding the work that I do. <clears throat> I also believe that the treaties that were signed, not secular, they're not secular agreements, they're not agreements that were locked in time, they're living. They're living entities, they have to be recognized in the spirituality that we, uh, that we advance our, our, our matters with. So sitting in politics, I always think, well, what are the foundations? What are the fundamentals that I have to stand by each and every day that I work through the issues that, uh, that are presented to me? And believe me, there's a tremendous amount of different issues that are presented. There's a lot of reaction. There's a lot of crisis in our community. But I've decided that, I've, I've decided very early on that I had to entrench myself. I had to embed myself in fundamentals that I thought were going to be key to, to getting us back to a, a healthy place. Because a lot of these issues that we see today, such as uh, 17,000 homes needing to be built in northern Manitoba, we see young people checking out of life way too early with suicide rates that are off the charts. We see a threat to our safe drinking water. I look at a lot of these issues that a lot of people will pay a lot of attention to as the consequences of living in a colonial society. The consequences continue to pile up on us. Funding cuts are there. You know, uh, the resource development is happening while we're, while we're locked away in our communities with, with just federal funding agreements which are supposed to drive our community without true economic participation. I don't believe in, in, that, in that kind of reality. I believe in something stronger, something empowered. So I've done my homework. <clears throat> I've looked at the elements of effective self-government for our people because I believe that that's where we need to go. We need to focus on rebuilding institutions that once uh, provided for us, strong institution of governance, strong institutions of education and health for our, for our people. To move towards uh, strong institutions of self-government, we need to consider that they're built on legitimacy, power, and resources. So I've decided to focus my energies on that. And when we talk about legitimacy, I'm talking about first and foremost the Indian Act, because I don't believe it to be a legitimate mechanism to realize government, to realize real government for our people today. I don't believe it's uh, legitimate in terms of how we define ourselves as Indigenous people. I believe that there's a lot of misinformation built around the Indian Act, how it's being used to manipulate who we are as Indigenous people. Some of you might have filled out a piece of paper at some time in your life, put it in an envelope and sent it to Ottawa to allow a bureaucrat in an office in Gatineau, Quebec, to decide for you whether or not you're a status Indian. Some of you may have done that. That's not the way we're supposed to determine who we are as citizens and members of our communities. It's up to our grandmothers to tell us who we're connected to and what community we belong to. We've got to get back to that understanding and take back our citizenship and our membership. That's just one example when I talked about legitimacy. One of the 
primary pieces, though, in order for self-determination to be realized towards self-government is to have access to your resources. And one of the biggest pieces of the mandate that I've pursued since I've become the Grand Chief and as a chief back home is a recognition of our sovereignty and our title to the resources that are in our traditional territories. <clears throat> resources being both natural resources in the ground, but as well as the natural resources that, that, that come to life expressed as human beings, the human beings in our families that, that represent so much potential. That to me is what our equity is. Our equity is that value that you hold in your mind and in your heart that says you're going to make a contribution. That's what I believe resource equity is, and I work on that every single day. When, when the National Chief started talking about resetting the relationship with the Crown, I thought, what a great opportunity to talk about the resource equity that we have, the vast wealth of resources that we have here in Manitoba, the vast wealth of resources represented by the young people that come to school and the young people that want to make a contribution. So we had a meeting here in Manitoba. We invited treaty chiefs from across the territory to come in and talk about what are we going to take to the Prime Minister's meeting in January of 2012, because we looked at that with optimism. We looked at that as a, as a big opportunity to sit down with the Prime Minister and to really get the ball rolling here. We talked about the, the, the dislocation and the relocation of the Dene in northern Manitoba. We talked about the Dakota who, who, are, who continue to fight an uphill battle facing issues of recognition in their ancestral lands. We talked about resource equity and the fact that we need to be recognized as sovereign title holders of the minerals and the vast wealth of our lands and our ancestral territory. And that's not being recognized right now, ladies and gentlemen. We talked about all that. So we rolled it up and we decided what is the best forum for moving this, this discussion along? Looking at the Canadian Constitution, looking at the history of the repatriation of the Constitution, we deem that the best the best process we could follow would be for a First Minister's meeting on First Nations issues. So we began an aggressive campaign in the media to, to relay that, that message. Because Mr. Harper and Mr. Avio were happy to try to present themselves as having a meeting between the two as if the, the markers were being moved. They were trying to pacify the growing feelings amongst our people by having a meeting between the two of them. But the popular political actors of the day, such as Mr. Harper, cannot reestablish or help us reestablish our equity in the lands that we call our own. We can't do that alone. What needs to happen is a constitutional forum it needs to happen, where all the premiers of the provinces come together with the Prime Minister, with First Nations people, to put all the issues on the table and start working them through. That's what we presented to the Assembly of First Nations from Manitoba. And that's what we presented to Mr. Harper. That's what I presented to Mr. Harper when I had five minutes alone with him in his office in January of 2012. It's interesting that our presentation never made it into the AFN website. The AFN website had said it would be uploading all of the regional presentations. But the ones from Manitoba never made it into their website for some reason. I don't know why. Mr. Harper did receive our, our request. He talked, about, he, he talked about it as blue sky thinking. Not practical in today's reality, which I thought was was, was very very difficult to hear. It was uh, very nearsighted. But uh, as we've come to come to realize, you know, a lot of the things that have happened within this uh, conservative regime, uh, you know, are not towards resetting the relationship to maintain status quo. So that's a, a reflection of the unfinished business document that we talked about, because there is unfinished business left from the 1980s constitutional meetings. That unfinished business includes a recognition of who we are as Indigenous people. Who is the Indian in Section 35, for example? That discussion needs to happen because we have an entire generation coming up in the early 1980s. We don't know who, the, who those Indians are in Section 35. You know? I do believe that that's an empowered Indigenous person in Section 35. I do believe there has to be efforts to create certainty in Section 35 of Canada's Constitution to ensure prosperity for all of us on a more equal basis. Because right now, as far as I'm concerned, we exist outside of Canada's Constitution as Indigenous people. We have unsettled questions. We are not naturalized Canadians. The way they apply law against us, the way they, elect, uh, the way they apply policy against us. We're treating people first and foremost with the conditions of our involvement. <coughs> In Canadian, in the Canadian Constitution remains outstanding. 
Some of the young people are born into, into, into this Canadian experiment without having that Section 35 piece in place. I myself am included in that. There's outstanding questions and outstanding business that needs to happen within that empty box. But what we've witnessed, what we've witnessed over the last number of years, and this is something you'll realize too in your education process, is that there is a, a policy game, a, a legal game, where there's smoke and mirrors that's being perpetuated. There's this idea that you need to have an Indian status card in order to have treaty rights. How many of us have sat at home sitting around our kitchen table and once we get that Indian status card believing that we have our treaty rights back? Well, that's not the truth. The truth is that you're born with your treaty rights. You're born with that freedom and that sovereignty within your family to, to be part of treaty. Whether or not you, you acquire that certificate of Indian status card or not is purely a matter of federal policy. It's purely a matter of, of a policy to prescribe to you an identity that they can control. That's what it's all about. As treaty people, we need to be willing to discard that particular card. We need to be willing to take that card out of our pockets and throw it in the garbage and say, regardless of the certificate of Indian status, that somebody else decided that I could have. I'm still a treaty person first and foremost. I don't need a, need a certificate of Indian status to be considered treaty. And if you follow the history, if you follow the history about the Indian Act and how people became attached to it through the treaty lists, through the treaty annuity lists, and if you follow the transitions that happened in the 1950s from the, from the treaty annuity lists to the Indian registry, you will see that the original people that were tied to, through the treaty lists are treaty people, but also status Indians. But since then, there has been a departure from that. Since the 1950s, there's been a departure from the recognition of treaty within the Indian Act. And you'll learn this as you go along if you don't know it already. But they continue to perpetuate that misinformation. In fact, if you're, if you're carrying moose meat, if you're carrying fish in your vehicle today and you're stopped on the highway by a conservation officer, if you have fish in your vehicle, if you don't produce your Indian status card, they'll give you a ticket. But that policy is, is incorrect. And if you challenge it in court, you'll win. We've recently won a court, a court case here in Manitoba where somebody didn't have their status card, so they, they were charged with hauling fish without a load slip. And once we went to court to demonstrate that those people were treating people, the province backed off and said, okay, we won't, we won't proceed. But they didn't change the policy. The policy of Manitoba conservation remains the same. They're still asking for that Indian status card, even though, even though not every Indian status person is a treaty person, and not every treaty person is a status Indian. It's a campaign of misinformation. It's a campaign of misunderstanding that they continue to push through. And we continue to go to meetings with Mr. Harper to perpetuate that misunderstanding. It's within this context that we've seen a very significant rise in the power of our young people. Following the January 2012 meeting, there's a series of events that happened here in Manitoba that we believe have led to a lot of the work that's happened in the last year on a national scale. Some of you may remember what happened on June 21st of 2012. There was an arrest made and there was a very big process that had been initiated towards pushing the issue of our murder and missing Indigenous women and girls in Manitoba and across Canada. That started here in Manitoba with a big push towards the Assembly of First Nations, which have resulted in that issue being brought to the Council of the Federation table with all the premiers. And they have since joined forces with us to call for a national public inquiry on, on that particular issue. But before we get any further into that, we have to talk about what happened in December of 2012. With all the things that happened last summer leading into our December meeting at the AFM, a lot of us went to the AFM in December, thinking that we're tired of sitting in a big meeting, passing resolutions that go nowhere. And that's really a lot of what happens. We pass resolutions, we make great speeches, and then nobody does anything because there's no resources there to do the follow-up work that's required of a, of a national organization. So we started the side meeting in December 2012. We decided, you know what, rather than sit here and talk back and forth to one another, we're going to go to Parliament Hill. So we walked from the, uh, from the hotel to Parliament Hill, and you can see there's a number of us there. That doesn't capture everybody because that's the main group that arrived, but there was also dozens of other people that came in from, uh, 
from different hotels to join us. You can see uh, Ogemaw Wallace Fox is at, is at the front. I'm in the I'm in the level behind him with uh, Treaty One Elder Elmer Kershaw and other leaders from from Manitoba and from other treaty areas. That was uh, the start, I think, of a of a significant shift because what we were trying to demonstrate as leaders in that time was that we had done just about everything we could within parliamentary processes and within Senate processes to change the discussion or to advance our issues and to talk about what it is that you know we disagree with, with the passing of new federal legislation. We saw a number of bills that have come up you know from the Harper government that were being started in the Senate for some reason through, through the House of Commons. If you start it in the Senate you don't have to put the money towards the committee work. So they're trying to do discount bills on Indigenous people. That's that's what we were witnessing. You know, so I went to the Senate and I talked to the senators. I was actually, uh, I made a Senate submission to the Senate committee and uh, it was like talking to a brick wall because the, the table was stacked with conservatives. The other side being the liberals and the liberals didn't have the numbers. You know, the conservatives run the Senate, if, if you don't know that already. So if we go through the process, it's just like talking to a brick wall and we get tripped up in that, in that process and then they pass the law anyway. So when you see us standing outside the doors of the House of Commons with Mr. Harper sitting in his comfortable chair in, in the House of Commons, and you see us standing there bringing our issues forward, that demonstrates that we've done everything we can from a diplomatic standpoint, from a negotiation standpoint. We've done everything we can to get the ear of the government to listen to our opposition to what they're doing, including Bill C-45 and C-38, the budget bills. This is the culmination of our frustration. I can tell you the only thing preventing me from pushing those those guards aside is that pipe. That's the only thing that stopped us. So that was December 4th, 2012, leading into January 2013. <clears throat> and uh, Chief Teresa Spence's his message. <clears throat> Some may uh, spend a lot of time thinking about what Chief Teresa Spence was doing on Victoria Island, but it comes down to one simple truth. That simple truth was that we have a grandmother whether she be the chief of Attawapiska or not, we have a grandmother who's going to sacrifice her own health for the betterment of the future generations of her family. And that is exercising a natural law, for those of you who don't know that. It's exercising a natural law. So we had a responsibility and leadership to go and recognize that. So we took the chief unity pipe to her teepee and we sat with her and we lifted that pipe and we said, we make a commitment here you know, that you're, you're leading this discussion from here on in. We tried to work with the AFN. The AFN has continued to put out its standard rhetoric from its writers. We saw very quickly that it did not see what the chief was trying to accomplish in that TP on Victoria Island. So we began to distance ourselves from that. Distancing ourselves from that meant that when the January 11th meeting came up, January 11th, 2013, we, um, we recognized that uh, January 2012, you know, we, we, I started to think about that, that phrase, fool me once, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me. You know, we look at the January 2012 meeting as not yielding anything substantial for our people. In fact, in January 2012, the Prime Minister went from our meeting over to China to tell the Chinese people that the resources are now open for sale here in Canada. Look, we've got pictures that we've, that we've pacified the Indians. And that's what the January 2012 meeting actually turned into, practically speaking, for the policy advancements of the Harper Conservative government that ties, ties into his energy plan. So I thought, you're not going to fool us twice, so we refused to go to the January 2013 meeting. What was being offered in January 2013 was, a, was, a, was an agenda that was already predetermined by the Prime Minister. A limited number of seats for chiefs that was already predetermined by the Prime Minister's office. A highly secured location, private, doors closed, no communication, no cameras, except the ones that he, he brought in by his people. So we decided not to go. And that's me and Raymond Robinson, and uh, I believe that's Chief David, right, Chief David Harper, right outside the doors of the Washington building, which is the Prime Minister's office in Ottawa. Standing with the people, deciding that we're not going to continue to be abused within an abusive relationship. <clears throat> And uh, a lot of, there's a lot of fallout from that. You know, uh, the media tried to paint me as a, as a bad guy. 
because I believe in prosperity for our people. I believe in a strong future for future generations of our people to live in peace and harmony and mutual prosperity. I was outcast as, a, as, a, as an idle threat because I said that our people, the indigenous people, have the power to bring Canada's economy to its knees. I wasn't saying that as a threat. I was saying that as a matter of fact. And within weeks, the commissioner from the Ontario Provincial Police affirmed what I had said. He had said that if the Indigenous people stand up to block, block the rails and to block resource development, they could shut down the Ontario economy. I wasn't saying that because I was trying to be trying to be scary to anybody. I was just saying that as a matter of fact, because we do have the power to control the future of, of this country. That uh, that top picture was the, uh, the actual the actual interview, the actual press conference that we held as we came out of our of our Manitoba caucus session, and that's where a lot of this. This, uh, this work started. <clears throat> Coming out of January 2013, we decided that it's time to move to a new direction. And uh, the relying heavily on the Idle No More movement and the, the resurgence, the renewal, and the strength and the empowerment of our people through the drum and through prayers and ceremony, we were moving towards what we call a treaty alliance. A national treaty alliance that we're talking about spans across the country, because we're not just talking about treaties with the Crown, we're talking about the treaties that we have made historically with one another, to live in peace and harmony in these lands, long before the settlers ever arrived in these territories. That is the work that we've been focusing on for the last number of months. One of the major pieces of that here in Manitoba was the Treaty Freedom Caravan, and that was the motorcycle ride that we took across the country to bring messages of, of freedom, messages of sovereignty, to the treaty communities across Western Canada. I, uh, I included that picture because I find it quite, quite funny. Uh, the, the different approaches that are being employed. I have, I have respect for Sean Abbey, you know, I, I, I don't disrespect him. I, I recognize the great difficulty he has and the position he has as a national chief, but we do things a little bit differently in the treaty territories out here, I think. And that difference has to be recognized. So we carry a treaty message. That is, the, that is the general route, starting at the Treaty 1, uh, the Treaty 1 signing at the Stone Fort in Winnipeg. We travel all the way to the uh, head smash to the Buffalo Jump, where there's a ceremony done with Treaty 7. We made our way up north into uh, the Cree territories. We had uh, tremendous celebrations and ceremonies in that territory. We made our way back down and around again, up into Dene territory, the Prince Albert Grand Council, back down into Treaty 4 and then up to Treaty 5. So we had quite the, uh, quite the trip. It wasn't a joy ride. Every single day was very, very difficult. There was uh, rain and wind on it, and on every single day of the trip, um, there was a lot of emotions. There was a lot of difficulty, but we engaged a lot, of, a lot of people. There was a lot of ceremony, like I said. We carried a message of freedom because, you know, a lot of us have young ones, and uh, you know, our young ones need to know that they're born into this uh, experience. They're born into this world as free, indigenous, sovereign people. They're not born to be uh, given a prescriptive identity under the Indian Act. It's only through our sovereignty are we going to be able to move past that Indian Act. And that's the message that we brought out there. And there was lots of young people that received that message. And we do believe we're doing some of the work that needs to happen in order to reestablish ourselves as, as a truly free Indigenous people that we are. That has to happen. That, that, that has to happen. The, the Indian Act has, is, is numbered. You know, we've been. Um, We've been created in such a way that we can become extinguished under that paper, under the Indian Act. And that is exactly what happened. That's exactly what will happen if you follow the mathematics uh, of the Indian Act. There won't be any status Indians left in, uh, in three or four generations. And that's what's happening right now. So we do have to redefine ourselves. We can't wait for governments to redefine us for it, redefine who we are for us. We have to do it on our own. And we have to do it from an empowered position. So that's what the Treaty Freedom Ride was about, was to bring awareness to that, greater awareness that we need to start moving forward now. And we can't just rely on our chiefs and councils in our communities, because our chiefs and councils in our communities are dealing with crisis every day. They're dealing with crisis every day in our communities, and they can't keep up with the types of crises that are happening, that are built into the policy systems that we're working in. It's going to take people who can sit back for a few minutes and recognize what's happening and step up and take on our responsibility and take on a role there. That's what it's going to be. And that's what the treaty fire was all about. With each community that we, that we visited, we offered a piece of the treaty fire so that each community would be able to, through their fire keeper, 
to the man's rule would be able to light a treaty fire in the community and let it burn for four days and to create that broader awareness. This is the treaty fire that we have in my home community, Pine Creek. <clears throat> that led to our national treaty gap by getting a late in, uh, in uh, I believe it was at the end of July of this year. We brought the Treaty of Alliance discussion forward. Um, different media will talk about who participated where. We had our meeting at the same time as the EFN meeting in Whitehorse. We had over a thousand delegates at the Treaty Alliance meeting coming in late. They had apparently close to a thousand, but I believe we had more chiefs from the Treaty Territory at our in the late meeting. And it's not about competition, but it's about establishing priorities and moving forward in a in a different direction. Because we are at that crossroads. The ceremonies that we participate in, the ceremonial people from the different treaty territories are recognized we're at a crossroads right now. This crossroads that we're talking about is one where we can continue down the Indian Act path. We can continue down this path that would be accepting provincial policies and laws, federal policies and laws towards our continued poverty, while a few people get rich off of our resources. Or we can begin with work to redefine who we are as the Indigenous people around here, outside of the Indian Act. That's the other, that's the other path we can take, to true empowerment. That's what the Treaty Alliance Movement is all about. It's not about duplicating a political organization and holding up a few people. It's not about that. It's about something much more fundamental to the human experience that we're having as families, as collectives within our communities and within our nations. The Alliance Movement is about getting right down to, the, to our communities and making sure that each person is empowered and understanding who they are as sovereign people, as free people. Because we need to, to reignite that understanding. We need to renew that understanding. Because that's the only way we're going to survive this type of uh, legislative genocide, that we might say, through the application of policy and law. That's why I take very firm positions publicly on many issues. I believe that there is a sovereignty that exists that's not being recognized. Provinces and governments and federal governments use their laws to hold us back. One example is happening right now as we speak in, uh, in Brandon. The Dakota people have decided that they're not going to rely on program and service money anymore from the government. They're going to move forward on their own economics. And they've established free trade routes with Mohawk tobacco in Eastern Canada. And those free trade routes go back hundreds, maybe thousands of years. And they want those free trade routes open so that they can build economies so they're not relying on government funding anymore. As soon as unmarked tobacco products come into Manitoba, you get arrested and thrown in jail. You get arrested and thrown in jail because you're trying to help your community overcome the, the poverty. That's what's being faced right now in the territory. The Red Sucker Lake First Nation has an injunction against it by a company called Mega Precious Metals. That company has put out an injunction against that community from accessing their ancestral land so that they don't disturb the uh, exploration activities of Mega Precious. And the province will say that they're out of arm's length from that, but the province is is responsible for passing the regulations and the laws that allow industry to come in and to poison the water, allowing industry to come in and take the valuable resources we have to, their, to the benefit of a handful of people, as opposed to allowing communities to prosper. That's what we're facing right now. And if I have to take a hard stand against that, to stop it in its tracks, that's the position I'll take as a politician. I won't participate in tables where they say, well, we're ready to give you a little back of resource revenue. Resource revenue is a policy position where they give us back a trinket or two at the end of the day. That's not what we're talking about either. We're talking about the recognition of our sovereignty and the wealth that we have as Indigenous people in our lands. That's what we need to talk about. It's equity that we're talking about. The vast equity in lands and wealth that we have. That's where I stand. And if I stand here standing still and appearing not to be moving forward anywhere for the time being, until that recognition is made, and I'm prepared to do that. I'm not going to compromise the provincial policy tables. I'm not going to compromise the federal policy tables that are meant to continue preserving the status quo and preventing us from realizing a, a brighter way forward. That's where we're at today. And you know, next couple of weeks we're going to be hosting the United Nations here in Winnipeg. And a special rapporteur on the rights of Indigenous people is going to be making a stop here on October 12th. We're doing the planning for that. They decided to work with the Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs to plan their agenda. So we have half a day on Saturday, October 12th, to show James and I who the Indigenous people in these territories are. 
And I'm asking all of you to come out and to show who you are. Bring a placard showing what you what, what you believe the primary issue is so that he can see it. Let's come out in great numbers to show Mr. Anaya that we are a strong indigenous people, that this is our territory. Let's welcome him here. We're planning an event that will include jingle dress dancers. We're gonna to want to know that very soon. But we believe that there needs to be a healing dance with the jingle dress dancers and the drums. And the men need to come out and form an arbor around those jingle dress dancers and they need the, the rapporteur needs to see who we are as Indigenous people, and we can provide him with that. So we're going to be putting out a call very soon for the Jingle Dress Dancers to be here on October 12th. For about an hour, we hope to be able to, to do a demonstration. And I think we should do it at the Toronto Portage in Maine, myself. I'm not sure yet exactly whether the city will like that or the Winnipeg Police, but we should maybe think about a proper location for that. But we need people. We need people to do this. As politicians, we can move the markers a little bit. We can stand strong and firm in our positions, but it's exhausting and it takes a lot of a lot of effort from a lot of people to make these things happen. So, with that said, that's my presentation. I went over time a little bit, but there's a lot of things I want to share with you. I appreciate the opportunity to speak, and I, I do hope we have a few minutes for, for questions and answers. Give me much thank you. It's an honor to have you, uh, and please let us know about the October 12th event. We have an incredibly active body of students who are very interested in supporting uh, local events, um, and specifically events around our sovereignty and our nationhood. Um, uh, we're going to open up to a question, so I want you to think of a question. We've got only a short amount of time, but um, maybe I'll start, because it's always the hardest way to start first. Um, I, there's so much I want to talk about and so many other questions I want to ask, um, but perhaps what we can start off is, uh, uh, what is the most inspiring uh, moment? Like, this, this past year has been characterized, and for those of us who are in the media, having to face, I had to do 13 different interviews on the day of the Treaty Alliance for, for media, and the constant question was around the negativity, around the sort of divided nature. Um, and so that was characterized by, the, I don't know, more moving off than these negative stories. But what for you was the most inspiring moment of the past year? Um, yeah, either an event or a moment or something that you can recall that really inspired you and gave you hope for the future. I think a lot of people would love to hear that. That's a, that's a good question because there have been a lot of uh, very inspiring moments that I've, that I've witnessed and that I've been part of. and. Uh, I could talk about perhaps uh, having having dinner, uh, being at the supper table with one of my mentors, uh, the late uh, the late Elijah Harper, and beginning our discussion around resources and resource wealth in Manitoba. And he started out the discussion by saying, you know, we don't want taxpayer money, you know, in our, in our communities. We don't want taxpayer money. We want our share of the wealth and resources, you know, and, and that that has stuck with me. That's actually been one of the one of the quotes that we use in all the work we do when we talk about resource equity. I can talk about um, in terms of inspiration, sitting in, in Chief Teresa Spence's TV and talking to her about what she what she's doing and why she's doing it. And uh, it's not so much the words that are exchanged, but the whole event and the the, uh, the, uh, the energy around what was going on uh, inspired me to a point where I think that the politics that happened before that time and the politics that are after are quite different. It's, uh, it's, that, that changed everything, I think, and um, very inspiring. Uh, I have lots of other questions, but maybe what I'll do is I'll invite anyone in the audience. Um, when you do uh, ask a question, if you, uh, you could just also introduce yourself, you just see what department you come from, or maybe what territory you come from. Something a little bit about yourself, and please remember that we only have about five, seven minutes, so uh, not too much of a preamble, just a quick question so we can uh, have our speaker respond to it. Is there any questions out there? Especially by our graduate students who are, this is part of their course, uh, so I encourage graduate students from our program to uh, ask any questions. Any out there? I know Peter's looking at me lots, but his preambles are eight minutes long, so we don't want to let him go. Uh, okay, I'll throw another one at you if you did. Um, 
Could you, uh, as a graduate student or a former graduate student uh, at university, what was uh, one of the books or a piece of writing or a moment or something within your school experience that was very formative for you? Um, and uh, what would you say to students today? What would be something they would either have to read or have to do or have to experience as a part of their educational journey? Thanks for that question. I was. Um I was at the University of Winnipeg, and I was very fortunate to, um, to, to be uh, taught by the late uh, Thomas Alba. Some of you may know him, and he taught uh, Indigenous knowledge at the University of Winnipeg. He was here his last years, and to me, that was that was very formative. That was one one of those uh, markers in, in the path of life that you, that you reflect on and say, "You know, I really learned a lot during this time." I would recommend any reading right now, one of the ones that I'm recommending to, to people, to become aware of how economic sanctions are used against our people. Economic blockades exist in policy and in law at both provincial and federal level. I would, I would talk about Sarah Carter's book, Lost Harvests. It's been around for a long time. It's a, it's a long, it's a, it's a publication that's been there for quite some time. And you want to look at, uh, you know, the, the early pieces that were put in place to prevent full participation of indigenous people in, uh, in, in, in economics. If you look at that book, you'll see how some of those early pieces were, were put down and how they continue to perpetuate in, in today's day and age uh, to, to hold us back into the ministry and full participation. I can't uh, imagine how uh, incredibly, as having spent uh, a long road trip with Tomasana, but I can just imagine how awesome it would be to take classes with him. So. Um, is there any other questions? Yes, uh, so go ahead. I think probably this is one of the last ones for questions. Go ahead. Um, it's very nice uh, what you mentioned about like a uh, true economy participation based on our resources and tools are self government for our communities. Uh, like a very briefly, you know, how would you explain like a small bit of strategic plan to achieve that goal? Well, we, uh, we recognize that the spirit and intent of the treaties was always to ensure mutual prosperity and, uh, and create uh, new economies, separate society economies intertwined with indigenous economies. They would have to become intertwined in order to take on mutual responsibilities and mutual obligations. And that didn't happen when the treaties uh, were signed and the, the economies that have come up around us since. But that doesn't mean that we still can't go back to that time and to reintroduce the discussion, to create a broader awareness of what the spirit and the intent of treaties are and what it, what it is all about, and to work on, on truly creating those economies that we believe can, uh, can ensure the prosperity of, of all of our people. We look at existing models that are out there outside of treaty territory. There are existing models where economic participation has been built into the law. You know, mutual interdependence in the creation of new economies exists the James Bay Agreement, for example. You see guys like Matthew Kuhn working in that, in that environment. There's also modern day agreements further in the East where percentages of resource royalties uh, exist written into the agreement. And uh, we believe that something very similar exists within our treaty agreement. We just haven't expressed it, we just haven't written it down. And we've approached governments on many occasions to take the concept of resource equity, the recognition of sovereignty over, over our resources, and work it into a, uh, turn it into a framework or a workable model that we can use in our communities towards realizing our, our economic potential and resource development, but also in an environmentally sustainable way to balance out those two, those two paths. We brought proposals forward at both the federal level as well as the provincial level, given that the province has control over resources through the natural resource transfer agreements. And, uh, we've come up with a brick wall time and time again. So we've had to do a lot of the work we've done so far in the Shushan recognizing that the, the provinces will always try to maintain the status quo. They'll always try to maintain and, and create an image that they're moving the markers along without actually doing that. So it's difficult work, but we're, we're, we're inching along. We have partnerships and we have discussions happening in the Wind of Fire as well to see what's happening there. We believe that the resource equity position we're building here in Manitoba can be used to help the negotiations out there too. So. Okay, uh, 
We're right at the end, but let's, uh, he's granted the grant chief to so read one more question if we can. Um, yes, please go introduce yourself before you. Thank you for the question. I do believe that we have to look at the self-government agreements that are, that are that are coming up now, like the mutual agreement might be one of those. We have to look at the, at the uh, Inner Labrador agreement. We have to look at the James Bay agreement. We have to look at what's been built into the discussion, because we do believe within our historical treaties it is implied that we would work on mechanisms towards implementing real economic interdependence amongst one another. And if these are manifesting, if these ideas are manifesting in modern day agreements, we cannot discard those modern day agreements and think that we can recreate the wheel. We have to look at some of the good work that's been done in other regions. And I don't think that that's modernizing our historical treaties in, in, in any way, because some people will say that that's what we're trying to do, but I don't believe it is. I think it's about realizing the spirit and intent of working between indigenous people and, and people who bring economic interests or proprietary interests into our traditional lands. I think that's a good question. I think that's exactly where we're headed. Thank you. And also say how uh, how important it is that self government agreements. And when I'm teaching students, I'm I'm often having to teach them that self government agreements doesn't mean the treaties then fall away. They're they're renewings or revisitations of those agreements. Um, so what we want to do is uh, the grand chief is uh, is going to spend 20 minutes uh, giving me a pep talk on how to grow facial hair properly. <laughs> so we really need to cut off his time. Uh, and he's uh, what we would like to give him a, a small. Uh, gift on behalf of both the building, so let's go grab it. The first gift is a uh, gift on behalf of Maisie Agamic, um, and we know you're very busy, and uh, the work that you do, if you uh, can take this with you, it's our wonderful uh, um, organizer or book, or what a note taker book, or whatever you like, with our uh, embroidered kind of name on the cover. So, thank you much for that. So, that's on behalf of Kaylee Storm and the staff here at Maisie Agamic. And the second is from our department. Um, I know you're an avid reader, and you're also uh, an avid uh, scholar and uh, intellectual as well. So this is a copy of Centering Anishinaabe Studies, which is a collection of works from Anishinaabe writers and thinkers, including Basil Johnson and many others uh, from across Turtle Island. And uh, we give this to you, um, say miigwech for your wonderful works today and for your time spent. You're very busy, but we, uh, through several emails and a big thanks, to your assistants, and specifically Sheila, for helping us organize this day. And so, uh, Miigwech for coming out and being on this territory. So, Miigwech. Right, I, I guess I, I accept the, the, the offerings that have been made here in a good way, and I always recognize that, you know, the, the real gift, even though we express it in the exchange of items, the real gift is the exchange of time. You know, and uh, I've been honored to share some time with you, and I'm very honored that you've listened to me and, and given me your time as we've uh, gone through the uh, presentations. Chinigwech, thank you very much. Uh,